Another basic algorithm that operating systems use is round robin. Round robin is if you have processes P1, P2, and P3, and your time quantum is four, so you give four time units to P1, then you give four time units to P2, then you give four time units to P3, then you go in a round robin manner, you go again to P1 and you give it another five, uh, another four, then you give another four to P2, and another four to P3, then four to P1, and so forth. It's, it's round robin, so you go around and you give the same time quantum to each process. So basically, you know, here, what's the, the, the advantage here? What's the goal? What do you see the Everything the process? makes progress. People be able to make some progress at time, you have a lot yeah. of user response. <laughs> okay, yes, that's true. So in terms of starvation here, do we have starvation? No. No, here we can never have starvation. We are giving time quanta for all processes because in terms of bounded weighting, if you have n processes in the ready queue, how many other processes will a process wait for? If you have n in the ready queue. N minus one. N minus one, yeah, exactly. So n minus one is a bound. So this is bounded weighting. So you will wait for n minus one other processes, which is bounded weighting, which means that there is no starvation. So here's an example. I have processes P1, P2, P3. I'm, I'm not showing arrival times, which means that I'm ignoring the differences in arrival time, and I'm assuming that all of them arrive at time zero, which is an idealization. And these are the CPU bursts. So P1 is going to get four. So the system is going to give four. We are assuming that the time quantum is four. So we're giving 4 to P1. Then we will give 4 units to P2. But P2 is not going to use the 4 units because the length of its CPU burst is four, is 3. So what's the, what will happen here in a real system after 3 time units, what will happen? So how will the kernel get control again? Is it a time quantum interrupt? No, this is not time quantum interrupt. So here, it's not a time quantum interrupt. The time quantum interrupt is set for four time minutes. So the time quantum interrupt will trigger after four time minutes. But what will happen after three time minutes? Yeah, there will be a system call because this process will either request I.O. or it will terminate. If it terminates, it's going to call the exit system call. It will notify the system that it's done. And if it requests I.O., it's going to make a system call. So in either case, it's going to make a system call to let the system know that it no longer needs the CPU. And then the system intervenes. And here at time 7, we're not showing the system intervention. We're not showing kernel time and context switching and all of that. So the system is going to give four time units to P3. And again, P3 is not going to use the, the entire time quanta, quantum that is allocated to it. It's going to do something after three time units, requesting I.O. or terminating. Then the system is going to give, now at time 10, how many processes are in the ready queue? How many processes are in the ready queue at time 10? One. One, only one. Because these are either waiting or terminated. The only ready process is P1. So now the system will give how many time quanta to, how many time units to P1? Four. Now, does it make sense now for the system to give it all the remaining time, which is 20? So will the system say, okay, the remaining time is 20, I'm gonna give 20 time units to P1. Does it make sense to do that? For multiple reasons, this doesn't make sense. Why? The new processes um, come into the queue wouldn't it have to check? Yeah, exactly. So it's, if, if the system commits 20 time units for P1, uh, then it's, uh, you know, it, 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 other processes, it, other processes may not get the CPU. So it's, it's not going to commit because other processes may arrive in the future. Okay. Also, more importantly, the system doesn't know. 
The system doesn't know that the remaining time is 20. The system doesn't know the future. So it, it doesn't know. It can only make a guess or an estimate, but it doesn't know that only 20 time units are remaining. So this is what we have. Now, what are the waiting times? The waiting time for P1 is the time it's spent in the ready queue, which is 10 minus 4, right? So 10 minus 4 is the waiting time for P1. What's the waiting time for P2? 4. What's the waiting time for P3? 7. So 6 plus 4 plus 7, this gives us the average waiting time. In this case. OK? Now, comparing this with sh uh, shortest job first, if we do shortest job first, what will the order be in this case? It will be like P2, P3, P1. And P2 will wait for 0 time. P3 will wait for 3. And P1 will wait for 6. six. So if you do shortest job first, P2 will wait for 0 time. P3 will wait for 3. Of course, these can be done in any order, either order. And P1 will wait for 6. And the average waiting time will be what? 9 divided by 3, which is 3. So shortest job first will definitely give you a shorter average waiting time. But what's the advantage of round robin? It's responsiveness, right? You know, round robin is responsiveness. That's the, the, the advantage. It's responsive, and there is no starvation. 